uh, open up with prayer. God, we are grateful and thankful for this day and we thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to come together and to share together. Uh, God, we're grateful for uh, your word and the study of your word. And we pray even now, Lord, that you will open up our hearts and our minds to receive all that you would have for us tonight. This is our prayer. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Let every heart say amen. Amen. All right. Let me first begin by saying thank you, um, everyone, for uh, being patient with me. Uh, last Wednesday, I was uh, under the weather, and um, I forgot what happened the week before that, but I, I, I truly do not like to miss Bible study. So um, I'm grateful for the opportunity for us to get back together today. Um, I do have capabilities to share my screen, so let me let's let's get started with that so i can share what we got going on here uh, show, current slide. okay all right so um we are still talking about the dna of relationships and um and life is a relationship the rest is just details of course that first chapter uh was really giving us the intro to um relationships uh, letting us know that everyone was created for relationships. Um, number one, we were created to have a relationship with God. We're created for uh, our own relationship, relationship within ourselves. Um, and then we're created for relationship with others. Um, so uh, we did chapter one and chapter two. I just want to give, uh-oh, what's going on here? Hmm. Okay. Um, I want to give a quick overview or a quick review, rather, I should say, of chapter two. Um, so uh, the dance that destroys relationships is really what we were talking about. Um, and the first thing uh, that we that we kind of shared was the external problem is rarely the problem. What we think is the problem is normally not the core problem. Um, it may be a problem but it's norm normally not the problem. So uh, the external problem is rarely the problem. Uh, number two, the core problem is our fear. The problem um, in nearly every conflict is that something touched each person's core fear. Uh, everyone, no matter who they are, wrestles with some type of internal core fear. And we talked a little bit about that last time we were together. Number three, each of us is involved in the fear dance. Um, triggered by a core fear, we get stuck in a destructive fear dance that involves our hurts, our wants, our fears, and then our reactions. And normally our reactions are negative um, and it causes the other person that we're in relationship with to have the same uh, uh, issues with respect to hurts, wants, and fears. Uh, number four, don't expect the other person to be the solution. Uh, when we hurt, we want other people to change so that we won't feel hurt. But the solution is not to change the other person. Um, and, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more as we delve into chapter three. Um, that, that's, that's not the solution. The solution is not to change the other person. Uh, we, we have to begin to address some things within ourselves. Number five, the fear dance is functionally dysfunctional. Because the fear dance is the only dance that some people know how to do, they function in the midst of the dysfunction. They adopt um, and adapt to uh, coping mechanisms, which normally only deepen the problem. Um, so we talked a little bit about that. And then number six, we can break the rhythm of the fear dance. Uh, when we identify our core fears and understand that the other person isn't the problem, we can begin to learn new steps to healthier relationships. So that, that's just a quick overview of chapter two. Uh, those six things that deal with the dance that destroys relationships. The external problem is rarely the problem. The core problem is our fear. Each of us is involved in the fear dance. Um, don't expect, see, uh, don't expect the other person to be the solution. 
The fear dance is functionally dysfunctional. And six, we can break the rhythm of the dance. So now um, let me ask this quick question. I'm not sure if anyone was able to do the homework. It's been two weeks now, so I'm sure it wasn't on anybody's mind. But we had said for those of you who have the book to turn to Appendix B and take the fear dance quiz. Take the fear dance quiz on pages 173 to 179, where we identify a recent conflict. Uh, we share how that conflict made us feel. Uh, we share our core fears, and then we share our reactions. And all of that was in those in those pages. It gives you an outline of, of, of walking through that. So now I don't know if anybody did it. If anybody did and would like to share um, what they came up with, you are certainly, um, would certainly let you do that. Um, if not, if not, for those of you who have the book, I want to suggest um, that, that for tonight's homework or part of tonight's homework to go into that appendix B and do the fear dance quiz and just, and just see what you come up with, um, see where you are, see how you feel about it. And then I will be asking for, for folks to, to hopefully be willing to, to share, to share, um, share. You don't have to be specific with respect to your, your, uh, specific conflict. Um, in terms of who the people are, in terms of what exactly the conflict is, but you can speak around it. Um, you can talk about, you know, how it made you feel. You can talk about um, how you were triggered. You can talk about um, what it is that being triggered did. Um, Brother Bethune, if you would do, okay, some, I was getting ready to say if somebody could let the person in, because if I try to let people in, it's going to cause me to go forward in my slides. Um, all right, so let's, let's, let's talk tonight about chapter three chapter three. The, the, the title of chapter three is The Power of One. Take personal responsibility. Um, brothers and sisters, this concept of the power of one is forever embedded in my mind. Um, I, I believe that it can be a life-changing concept for those interested in not continuing in the fear dance and finding some new dance steps. Um, I know that I use, I, I probably quote stuff from this chapter um, in talking to people with, with their respective relationships than probably any other chapter. No, no, maybe not. But this is a major, a major thing that I believe will help people. All right. So the power of one, take responsibility. Let's, let's delve in. Um, have you ever tried to stop the fear dance, but feel like you just can't? Um, has anyone ever tried to stop the fear dance? Um, that which we've talked about in, in chapter two, um, but feel like you just can't stop it. Do, do these words or phrases sound familiar to anybody, um, you don't see you don't see it, do you? <laughs> you're always so negative. You say you're sorry, but you don't mean it. You keep doing it over and over again. You will never change. Forget it, then. Go and do what you want. See if I care. I'm just not talking about that anymore. And then here's another one. That subject is not up for discussion. I'm curious to know if anybody has said one or two of those things, heard those things in some of your relational uh, interactions, uh, some of these words. Yes, I, 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 I will admit I have, I am guilty on both sides. I have said it and I have definitely heard it. I have definitely heard it. Um, so, so, so uh, these these are some statements, phrases that are familiar to us um, that we think we are no longer dancing, but really uh, cause the dance to keep on going. Um, and part of the reason why um, that happens is because I, uh, there, there, there's, there's a common thread that goes through most, if not all of those phrases. It's 
you, you, your, you say, you, you, forget it. You do you. I, I'm not going to talk about this anymore with you. Uh, th this is not up for discussion with you. No, you, you, you. Um, so it's always the same dance. And it always appears to be the other person's fault. H how do we break the rhythm of the dance if neither person budgets? Then the dance could go on forever. And in some cases, and for some people, it does. Um, how do we stop the madness when we don't realize that it takes two to tango but only one to stop the dance. The way uh, that we stop doing the same dance is by understanding what this author calls the power of one. Understanding the power of one has the ability to revolutionize relationships. All right? Um, so you have, brothers and sisters, the power of one. Uh, fear buttons get pushed every single day. Yet it is our reactions to those fears that determine whether we will get stuck in the fear dance. A at the end of the day, you control the thoughts that control your reactions, not external circumstances. I want to say that again so that that could sink in. At the end of the day, you, my brother, my sister, control the thoughts that control your reactions, not your external circumstances. I think I talked a little bit about that um, in this morning's prayer call um, when I did the devotional. Uh, we may not have control over the circumstances, but we certainly have control over how we react to those circumstances. So you can't control, we can't control everything in terms of what we have to deal with in terms of circumstances. But what we do have control over is our reaction to what it is that we're confronted with. So you have a choice about how you can react. Um, if, if you react negative, that is your choice to have a negative reaction. If you react out of bitterness, it is your choice to react in a, in a, a way that is bitter. Um, no one else, watch this y'all, controls how you think. Nobody can control how you think. N no one can control how you think. All right, no one else controls how you react. You know how people say, oh, uh, so-and-so made me do it. No, no, nobody made you do anything. It is how you chose to react, how you chose to react. The fear dance can't be external. It has to be internal. It has to be internal. You have the power of one, um, and it takes only one person to, to stop the destructive dance, and that person is you. You are the one that can stop the dance because you have control over what you think. You have control over how you react. What are your, what are your reactions to that? Before we move any further, what are your reactions to that? You, uh, Brother James, I see your hand. I just took the moment to unmute myself. Okay. Yes, sir. You interrupt that fear dance, and then it comes back is you get you here. Oh, you let's say you just simply say, okay, I am not going to continue talking about it, and you interrupt the conversation or you stop the back and forth. Then you're saying you don't want to, then you get the uh, accusation of you don't want to communicate. Now, does that draw you back in? It, it can, because how you react to that determines if you get drawn back in or not. Absolutely. Uh, if, let's say we're having a discussion, and mm -hmm. I see 
that it is going back is is you no know, you the cause I'm the cause you the cause and then you just say okay I tell you what whatever you say is correct and then you just say you could you stop the conversation now you hear oh you 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 you, you don't want to communicate anymore right but see here's the thing with with responding in that manner when you okay. respond in that manner what you're saying is oh you know what whatever you say is right which which is a trigger for some people um and and if you trigger them in that way it starts to dance all over all over again um so 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 again and as we move forward we're going to talk about how you we're going to have to take the onus off of you and learn how to put the onus on me me the only person i can control is me. I can't control you. I can't control what you think. I can't control how you act or react. The only one I have control over is me. That power of one is you, is you. And so there are some steps. There's some steps that we're going to talk about um, that kind of deal with exactly uh, what you shared a few seconds ago. So if there's no other comments or questions, I'm going to move. Okay. So, yes, Sister Bullock. So you have to be, oh, uh, good evening, everybody. Good so evening. Have, so good to hear you. Thank you. So, so you have to be very, very careful on how you control stopping the fear dance, the tone of your voice, the inflection in your voice, the words that you use, because as you stated, Pastor, you're going to hit a lot of triggers. So okay. it's a skill in doing that. So, and it's a, it's, well, I know it was a hard lesson for me to learn um, with making sure the way I say it, I don't say it with the attitude, you know, um, my mom used to say, say it in love and pray over what you're going to say before you right. say it. Right. That's absolutely, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Um, all right. So let's move forward. Let's move forward um, and, and deal with these six steps, six steps to take control of your emotions and reactions to life, all right? Uh, step one is we have to take control of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. Um, we have to take control of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. Whenever you focus on what the other person is doing, you take away your own power and end up trying to control things that you cannot control. You make yourself weak, you relinquish your power. Whenever you focus on what the other person is doing, that's two slides ago, I think it was, three slides ago, you, if you would just stop doing this, if you, would, if you wouldn't do that, if, if you, well, you know what? You go ahead and do that. You be right. You, you, you. Whenever we are uh, focusing on the other person, we're taking away our power, our power. Um, the power that we have to make our own uh, uh, act, to, to uh, rather have our own thoughts, have our own feelings and have our own actions. Um, so, we have to choose to exercise personal responsibility for your own actions. Now, brothers and sisters, this 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 is this is something that's that uh, is uh, self-reflected. All right, um, to take personal responsibility means that you refuse to focus on what the other person has done and you begin to look at yourself and say to yourself, what role do I play in all that is going on? All right. How difficult is it, um, especially when we like to play the blame game, that, that it's very difficult to, to take responsibility for ourselves, to take control of our own thoughts, feelings, and actions, it's difficult to do that when we are accustomed to playing the blame game. Um, 
when 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 it's so much easier to point the finger at somebody else, it becomes infinitely difficult or more difficult, I should say, to see where we fit into the equation. Um, this was a conversation, watch this y'all, that I was just having recently. Um, and this, this may be a key to helping to stop some generational curses. Somebody said that I was talking to that they were like, um, that they were like, they, they were the way they are because they were just like their mother, right? It's almost like saying, it's my mother's fault that I am the way that I am. And here's the thing about that. Um, if we recognize that we are like someone who has influence on us that we don't particularly care for or like, at what point do we make the choice to shift the paradigm? It's so much easier for people to say, you know what, I'm just the spitting image of so-and-so. That's just who I am. No, if you're saying that, what you're saying is I'm choosing to be just like that, which I may not necessarily care for. We can choose to exercise personal responsibility for our own actions. You know what? If that's what they did and I'm seeing that rise up in me, then I need to fight against that because that's not what I want to be. That's not who I choose to be. That's not who I'm going to be. We have to take personal responsibility. All right. Taking personal responsibility requires us to take a good long look at our side of the equation all right where where do i have the power to shift who and what i think or or what i think what i feel and how i act and react um if you want to control your reactions you need to control your thoughts. Uh, let me just read an excerpt from the book. Uh, Dr. Archibald Hart's book, Habits of the Mind, has shaped my perspective about the power of our thoughts. He says, our body is the servant of the mind. It obeys the operations of the mind, whether they be deliberately chosen or automatically expressed. Disease and health, like circumstances, are rooted in thought. He goes on to say that feelings are the consequences, not the cause of our emotional problems. Our emotions are good sources of information about how we are thinking. We cannot control our emotions directly, but we can influence how we are feeling by changing our thoughts. Change our thoughts first and the desired feelings will follow. Our reactions, our emotions, our attitudes are the result of our thoughts. The Bible, instructs us to take every thought captive. It's, it's an essential part of Christian living that eludes many of us. When thoughts go unexamined, they can do a lot of harm. They can get out of control and cause negative cycles that lead to negative feelings and negative actions. Step one, Take control of your thoughts, of your feelings, and of your actions. What are your thoughts about that? Thoughts on step one, anyone? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Agree, disagree? Need to, need to think it through a little more? It's easier said than done is all I got to okay. say. 
<laughs> I, I uh, Sister Sneed has her hand raised. Okay. Hi. I, I be, oh, wait a minute. No, no, don't, don't start. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh. I, I think that um, that's a really good point. I definitely agree with it. And I can tell you that when I was growing up, I was a little probably unusual because I had siblings, had uh, two sisters and a brother. When I saw them get in trouble for doing something, I made up in my mind that I was never going to do that. I, and that's how I've spent my life is if I see someone doing something negative and getting in trouble for it, then I don't do it. Likewise, if I see someone doing something positive, I try to emulate them. So anyone can be a role model for me, either good or bad. So I, I do believe that you can take control. And honestly, I, I love this particular chapter, The Power of One, because I definitely see myself in it. Uh, and okay. that is by not allowing other people to influence me or influence my decisions. So yes. I take control. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Brother James. The problem with all of this is that that's assuming you have the time to think this thing out. But in generally in this type of situation, it's a hot moment and you're in the thick of it. So you going back and forth with that person, or, or your spouse or your or whoever you're engaging in this uh, to and fro with. So do you have the time to think this process out? So what do you have to do? You have to, to have that mindset going in? I mean, right. generally when these kinds of contentions come up, they're not planned. They like, they, they spring up on a spur of the moment. So the mm -hmm. self-control that it takes to apply this principle in the thick of it can be quite challenging. Right. So I'm not saying that this is these are steps to six steps to take control of your emotion. So what has to happen is this needs to take place. Once you identify the areas that we need to work on, we should start working on them so that when the next conflict comes, we can begin to. Right. Right. Yeah. This is this is not stuff that you you do right in the midst of what's going on. This is the stuff that, that once you realize, uh, you know, here's some areas in my life I need to work on. When you start working on it, as you work on it, you'll discover that these are concepts that will help you in your relationships moving forward. Um, so, yeah. All right. So that's, that's step one. Step one. Uh, step two. Step two says, uh, take responsibility for your button. Um, it doesn't help a relationship to focus on all the stuff you think the other person needs to change. On the other hand, it is useful to address what you are doing, to look at your own thoughts, your own reactions, your fears, your emotion. So this is the work that needs to be done ahead of time, um, like we just shared by James. Um, it, 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 does not, it does not help uh, when we're always focusing on what the other person needs to change. You need to change how you think. You need to change what you do. All of that stuff may be true, but at the end of the day, guess what? You can't change another person. The only person you could change is yourself. And so it, it's more helpful in relationships to work on yourself so that it puts you in a better position to be able to be in relationship with other people. Um, when you do your own personal work, and this is what uh, Sister, Sister Bullock alluded to, when you do your own personal work, it takes time. However, when you take the time to do it, it can work. So it's not something that you just automatically pick up. But I, I tell you, it is an eye opener in a lot of areas of our lives. When, when you kind of see the cycles and see uh, the patterns that take place um, and you begin to look at things, it's an eye opener like, wow, I need to take more time with me. 
I need to take more time developing me. I need to take more time understanding my thoughts and my feelings and, and why I react the way I react. So when, when your buttons are pushed, remember that they are yours and you're responsible for them. You are in charge of your button. You know how it, you're in a relationship with somebody and they know exactly where to push you. They know exactly what to say, when to say it, how to say it. They know exactly where to touch you to get under your skin to start that fear dance, right? So what the author is saying is we have to be uh, mindful of the fact that we're responsible for our button, even though you know that that gets to me and you know it's gonna cause an argument when you touch that button. I need to be responsible for my button. I need to be responsible for the, all right, so since I know personally that that's what gets to me, what am I gonna do about that? How am I gonna address that? How am I gonna deal with my button? We expend too much energy on trying to control someone else's behavior so that they won't push our button. We, we spend too much time trying to shift and change people so that what they do and don't do, uh, how or how they do what they do doesn't affect us. Let's spend less time uh, dealing with them and more time working on us. Oh, I know I'm getting, all right. People understand making choices about their behavior but they don't always understand that they also make choices about their thoughts and their ideas. Um, so, so we have the ability uh, to make choices about what we think, how we think, and then how we act and react to that. So, so we have to take responsibility for our butt. What's, any, any, yes, sir. I'm smiling because this is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is it exhausting? <laughs> this is work, man. This is not like you just snap a finger and you're there. No, it's not. That's why I said it, when, when you, especially when you do personal work, it's work. It's work. It's work. And, and here's the thing. And when, we, and when we really take time and spend time looking at ourselves, we discover that a, we, we got some stuff with us. You, you know, we, we really do. We really do. Uh, it doesn't matter how well you think you are or you, how well you think you navigate through things and how good you think you do. When you really take time to sit and think about it, you're like, wow, you know, you mean to tell me I let all of that get to me? I, I let people say that and I get affected by it. I see two people with their hands raised. Uh, we'll get Darlene and then uh, Brother Smith. One of my favorite persons that I like to listen to is Ayana Van Set. And what we just said, she states it very clearly. You have to do the work. Do and work. in doing the work, you have to be, it's a lot of self-examination. And if you're not brutally honest with yourself, it's not going to change. It's going to be the same vicious circle. So, and it is time consuming. And I think what happens is when some people do start doing the work, wow, do you find there's some, a lot of stuff with yourself that you might not particularly like. And it might take you a minute, more than a minute. I'm just using that phrase to really right. be right. honest and, and be, get yourself out of denial and really start doing something for the positive. And it's very, very time consuming. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that's why the, the, the phrasing of step two really helps because it's not just acknowledge your button, it's take responsibility for them. And when you're actually taking responsibility for them, that's when that's when you have to be real with yourself and you have to be uh, honest and upfront with yourself. Brother Smith. Yeah, I was just going to say I could relate on a few different levels. First, uh, I can think of work examples where someone has pushed my buttons um, yeah. and the the honest emotion would have been um, to react, you know, particularly in regards to step one and step two to react and 
you know, cause them harm either verbally or otherwise. Yeah. But the reality is that um, there is an opportunity there uh, to really take a look at yourself and say, okay, was the, what did I do to instigate the situation? How have I opened myself up to let this person get at me? And most importantly, how am I going to react differently the next time so that I get a better result? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. All right, let's 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 move to step three. Let's move to step three. Um, step three is uh, just just what you said. This is a good segue. Don't give others the power to control your feelings. Um, we we give we give people too much power. If somebody knows exactly how to get at you. We've given them too much power. If somebody knows exactly what button to push, we have given them too much power. Freedom and responsibility are merely two sides of the same coin. Real freedom in relationships cannot be achieved if you keep letting others control how and what you feel. How are we gonna let people control how we feel and control what we think, control how we react? Uh, control our thoughts on a thing. Um, sometimes you have to remind yourself that in a tug of war, it only takes one person to drop the rope in order to end the power struggle. Um, once one person drops the rope, guess what, y'all? The game is over. If, if I drop the rope and say to myself, I am no longer going to allow you the power over me, guess what, y'all? That fight is over. That struggle is over. That dance is over. Because they can no longer get to you uh, because you have no longer allowed them the opportunity to uh, to push your buttons in that way. All right, I see another hand. Brother James, yes, sir. Before we go to Brother James, there's someone in the chat okay, I'm sorry. that says, Thank you. Sometimes if you let others, that the idea is their idea. Uh, I think I've heard this before, that they'll be real okay with the situation. Let them think it's their idea. I, I'm good. I, I, yes, yes. We, we, we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. <laughs> Brother James. To a large extent, isn't this a, a measure of what we really think of ourselves? In other words, if you're not confident in who and what we are internally, then it's very difficult to recognize when our buttons are being pushed. If you're a person who is unstable in, in, in inside oneself, then you are sub, you're very subjective to criticism, even when it's not criticism. So, so this is why uh, everything builds upon everything else. You remember when we first started this conversation, we said that we are built for relationships, right? We're built for relationships. First of all, relationship with God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. Um, this is that first command of prom, you know, this first command. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And we talked about how relationship with self has to come before relationship with others, right? So, so it begins with our relationship with God, but then we, where we have all, well, where we have messed up is in understanding who we are, finding out who we are and, and what we are and what we have and what our capacity is. Um, and, and we, we, we skip that step and then try to just go into relationship with other people. You know, if, if, you, never, if you never knew what it meant to love yourself, um, how will you recognize someone else loving you? you? You understand what I'm saying? And And so often in any relationship, it could be marriage, it could be a friendship, it could be a work relationship, if, if you have not taken time to find out who you are, then you will allow other people to dictate to you who you are. This is what you're supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to act. This is what things are supposed to be. And, and so again, it's, it's imperative to understand in, this, in this, uh, this whole context of relationships, uh, 
you know, we need to be in relation with God. We need to understand ourselves, and then we can be in relationship with others. I tell people all the time, you know, when I um when I counsel uh, people that are talking about getting married, I always ask them, why do you want to get married? And a lot of times they say, oh, because this person this, that person that. And I say, yeah, I heard a lot about what you said about them. Why do you want to get married? You know, because at, at what point did you say to yourself, I know who I am and I'm ready to share my life with somebody else? You know, and, and sadly, people never have that conversation about understanding who you are so that you can share your life with somebody else. All right. So that, that's um, but 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 again, um, it, it all starts with us understanding of who we are so that we don't give over our power or our control to other people. You know, at, at some point, at some point you know, that, that person should not be able to touch those buttons all the time and it still affects you in the same way. It, at, at some point, as you develop yourself and do the work yourself, um, you should be in a better position that, that uh, you take your control back. You take your control back, all right? Um, any comments or, or questions with respect to step three? How about when you're trying to drop the rope and then you have other people coming to you? Well, you know what that person said about you and you know what they said in the meeting about you yeah. and all of this. I'm like, okay, I don't care, but you should care. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to let this go. So how right. do you deal with that? Yeah, it's not important. It's not important what they're saying about me. Um, I know I know who I am. I know the work that I do. I know what I bring to the table, you know, and what others are saying is not necessarily important. So um, thank you, but but no, thank you. I don't I don't need that. You know, at the end of the day, in a work relationship, the only the only person that that you really need to be kind of concerned about with respect to that is who you report to, correct? Because aren't they the ones that that you know give you your bonus that give you your they, they, uh, at the end of the, at the end of yes. the day everybody else is it's their opinion it's it's you know it's conjecture look I'm not concerned about that thank you for sharing but I don't you know I'm not gonna allow that to affect me um, because I I need to know what I bring to the table I need to know what I'm doing and I need to know and and you know I need to be able to effectively communicate that to to whomever you know. I report to or things of that nature. And, and let's be honest, that stuff, especially if, if your core fear, if one of your core fears is, um, uh, da, 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 da. fear of rejection. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. If one of your core fears is the fear of rejection, then you will, you will sometimes even seek that out. Well, what what is other what are other people saying about me? You know, I want to make sure that I'm in the right light with everybody. Well, at the end of the day, you know, some people are not gonna like you just because they're not gonna like you. <laughs> you, you. You know, and it has nothing to do with you, um, your performance, what you bring to the table, who you are. They just, for whatever reason, they just don't like you. And if you are a person who whose core fear is rejection man, that's going to hit your button every single time. And you're going to try to seek to try to please everybody. Um, and, and again, we, we have to understand, we have to understand who we are. So let's, let's uh, move on to step number four. Oh, wow. Look, <laughs> step number four is don't look to others to make you happy. Don't look to others to make one of the things that will help you take control is clearing up some prevailing misconceptions. Here's one misconception in relationships, and mm -hmm. we have to dispel this, this, this right here. Um, this whole 50-50 myth, this whole 50-50 myth. You know, in marriage, Ooh. in marriage, I hear people all the time, they come to me and say, oh, you know, um, this is my better half. <clears throat> that, you know, that, that, okay. This, this, we, you know, we come to this 50-50. My brothers and sisters, when God created each and every one of us, we were 100% people. And, and there, I don't need, you don't need anybody 
to complete you. You are complete in and of yourself. When God made you, he said it's good. Now, there's a difference between completing someone and complimenting someone, but we don't need anybody to complete us. People can compliment who we are, but they don't complete us. So that's that whole 50-50 myth, it's a myth. And we have to dispel that myth. Or I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Well, listen, I could go get a scratcher and I could scratch my own back. Just like you could scratch your... So, so again, we have to learn how to start dispelling some of these myths. You don't need anybody else to make you happy. And that's a problem. If you are depending on someone else for your happiness, there's a problem. There's a problem. Um, so, uh, so, so, so we got to dispel that that back scratch in fifty fifty minutes. Uh, what we often call needs. This is another thing uh, about uh, looking to others for happiness. What we often call needs normally better fit in the category of wants. Okay, um, we want people to respect us. We think we need people to respect us. The truth is we want people to respect us. We, we, we want people to admire us. We, we want people to feel like, um, we want people to be needed by us. We, that's what we want. We don't need those things. That's what we, we want. Um, because here's, here's the bottom line. Only God meets all of our needs. And when we depend on others to meet our needs, then our relationships are in trouble. If, if, if you have a particular rate relationship because it only meets a specific need, th then, then your relationship is in trouble because at the end of the day, it's God who supplies our needs. What people do is they help to you know, give us what we want, but not necessarily what we, we need. Oh, all right. So, um, so there's a quote. Where's this page at in the, in the book? Um, page fifty-two. Here it is. The truth is, <clears throat> no one can make you happy. Not a spouse, not a friend, not a boss or a neighbor, not even a pastor. Abraham Lincoln spoke wisely when he said, "I reckon that people are about as happy." as they make up their minds to be. You and not someone else choose how you will react to what life throws at you. You and no one else decide what you will do when someone pushes your button. The practical equivalent of you will be about as happy as you make up your mind to be is nothing but only by exercising the power of one, by taking personal responsibility for your actions, will you find the secret to building strong relationships. Before you finish this book, uh, he says, I will show you how I recently used the power of one to bring my own stress level to the lowest level of my life. Even my blood pressure dropped. I chose to think about life in a way that miraculously changed me. I share this here because we want you to know that the thoughts you have and your reactions to life determine your level of happiness and fulfillment. My brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. How many times have you worried yourself sick? How many times have you caused your own stress? You've caused your own anxiety. And, and this is not, and I'm not talking about those people who really deal with mental health issues of depression and anxiety. I'm talking about some of the stuff that is caused by us, by how we think, by how we react, by what we allow to get to us. Whenever we are, allow, are trying to allow other people to make us happy, it'll put us in a position um, It'll put us in a position that we'll mess ourselves up. We'll stress ourselves um, over things. Some stuff is made up. They said sometimes, you know, people uh, have 
deal with worry in their life over things that are not even going to happen to you. It's, it's more, this is what could happen. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to have, you know, we stress ourselves out because of our own thinking, our own feelings, and our own actions. And we got to take that away. We got to take that away from people. And we have to take control of one, us. We have the power of one. The thoughts that you have, your reactions to life determine your level of happiness and fulfillment. If your entire well-being and delight in life depends on how someone else treats you, then you are in for a bumpy ride. But if you decide to take control of how you react to challenges, how you react to insults, how you react to difficulties, how you react to conflict um, that come your way, then a whole new world opens up. Watch this, y'all. One that is marked by peace. When, when, you, when you are in control of your thoughts, you can have peace. When you are in control of your feelings, you can be at peace. But when you're not, when you give that power over to somebody else, you'll be stressed out all your life. You'll be stressed out. Every, everything will stress you out. Everything. Every, every person will stress. Let me ask you a question. How many times have we been stressed out over somebody else? Somebody else has caused us to be stressed. So again, y'all, um, we, we, we can't expect other people to make us happy. We, we, have to, we have to learn how to take control of our emotions and our reactions in life. Anybody, what, what are your thoughts on, on step number four? Anybody? Oh, man, it's getting late in the evening. <laughs> step number four, anybody? No, don't look, don't look to others to make you happy. All right, well, let's, let's keep pressing. Um, step number five, become, become the CEO of your life. Be become the CEO of your life. Whew. All right. Um, let me ask this question. When did you become an adult? When, when did you become? I'm not talking about at the age of 18 or the age of 21 when you became legal. I'm talking about when did you become an adult? An adult is someone <laughs> who is fully capable of being responsible for themselves and who fully take responsibility. 79. A person, huh? 79. 79. <laughs> <laughs> that, hey, that, that's real talk for some. Listen, a person who's capable of responsibility but doesn't accept that responsibility is functioning as a child. <laughs> so what I'm trying oh, yeah. to say is, I'm still becoming an adult. Uh, even at this late age, I haven't fully uh, mastered that, you know. Um, one of my prime principles is like, going a little bit back to the last subject matter is never bottle somebody in. In other words, you can be right and not win the fight. So you have to be satisfied in knowing that what you are doing or saying is correct. And not and not need to have the other per person acquiesce or give in. So, if you let if I, if you let if you give a person uh, a chance to escape, even though you are in the right, then you have control, more control of your inner emotion. If if you if you kind of understand what I'm trying to say, I do. I do. Can I take that one step further? I want to take that one step further because one of the Come things on. that we may we may have to realize is that why do we have to win? Why why does why does there have to be a winner? And and again, this this is something where we have to start taking responsibility for our thoughts. Um, you know, one of the things is if if we're having a discussion, if we're having um, even if it's a heated discussion, what, what is the goal of a discussion? To get an understanding. So if we're trying to get an understanding, why does there have to be a winner? Why does somebody have to be right? Why does somebody else have to be wrong? It, 
we, we have to begin to, to rethink sometimes how we even approach. And that's why, that's why this, this, this work, it takes a lot because it's internal. It's internal because we've been programmed to think, hey, you know, there, there needs to be a winner. Somebody got to win. Ain't no tie in this. <laughs> Somebody got to win this thing, you know? But, but we, have to, we have to rethink. That's just like there's a scripture, right? That, um, that Paul talks about finishing the race, right? He says, um, you know, I fought a good fight. I've uh, kept the faith. I finished the race, right? Do you ever hear him say he won the race? No. He said he finished the race. There's a different, there's a different level of thinking when you're concerned about winning and you're concerned about finishing. You, you, you don't understand what I'm saying? And so, and so we have to begin to rethink, our, um, re, rethink ourselves or, or take inventory of ourselves and our own thoughts um, so that we can kind of get away from this mentality where somebody got to win, somebody got to lose. Um, because what ends up happening is somebody gets hurt um, and then sometimes we get hurt and then again, it goes into that fear dance and the cycle continues. Sister Darlene. And that point of winning and losing is part of becoming what I call a full pledged adult. When yeah. you get away from that mentality. Now I feel the opposite way that brother James felt. I felt like I became an adult a long, 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 long time ago because of how I was raised and because of circumstances and because I did a lot of things sooner than most average people. So for yeah. me, I feel like I became an adult when I was a teenager. That's how I yeah. seriously feel. And yeah. my girlfriend and I have this running joke that, oh my God, if we ever stop being the responsible adults that we are right now, people would probably, mm -hmm. or our family members would look at us and go, put them in a mental institution, something wrong with them. Because we've yeah. been adults since teenagers. So if we deviate yeah. now at 57 from the behavior that they've seen for 30, 40 years, it probably would freak them out and they would think we're having a mental breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. So some people are forced into adulting that's, um, early in life. That's what, what about adulting. that? Sometimes um, we are forced to act like an adult when we are not mentally prepared to be one. Correct. Correct. Um, and, and that's why, watch this, that's why sometimes our emotional um, state has to catch up to where we are forced to be in. You ever notice that sometimes? Sometimes in, in life, um, where we are emotionally is not necessarily where we are physically. Absolutely. And sometimes, sometimes our emotional state has to, has to learn it's to be more of an adult. And that's what all this is talking about is that, that um, our emotional um, state has to be, I, don't, I can't depend on other people for happiness. I, I can't depend on other people to make me happy and to, to, you know, to do it for me. At, at some point, I have to become an adult and take responsibility for my own. Yes, sir, Brother Smith. Yeah, I guess I'm somewhere between the two uh, last two responses. I felt like I was around 40 when I reached uh, um, the emotional, I had the emotional uh, IQ of, of an adult. And what I mean by that is that I th thought about your, your, your examples. There were things that would have set me off earlier in my uh, marriage, earlier in my uh, work life, where I was always looking for that external validation. If I didn't get it the way I wanted, I get frustrated and it kind of set me off for the rest of the day from, yeah. from my course of where I should be going. But I think there was a point around that time in my life where I was like, all right, I can't be worried about what kind of score I'm going to get at work or what kind of raise I'm going to get. Something, there has to be something else, um, greater meaning to one's life. And, and you have to kind of take ownership of that because um, you're never going to get consistently that validation from other people to make you happy, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, That's right. right. That's, That's correct. Right. That's right. That's right. right. Thank you for sharing that. That's right. So taking responsibility means accepting the job as an adult. Let me let me get on to, to uh, 
Oh no, there's a couple more things here. Two choices, two choices that can be made in becoming the CEO of your life that can help to lower stress and experience more joy and peace. Number one, give up or give to God all your expectations that people, places, and things will bring you lasting happiness and fulfillment. Can I tell y'all, I, I, and this is this Don's God truth, um, before, before I, I started working in ministry full time, I worked in corporate America. And, um, and one of the things that I kind of came to grips with is that, hey, at the end of the day, God takes care of me. God is going to do whatever God needs to do in my life. I am going to always give 100% that I can. I'm going to always put my best foot forward. I'm going to always give my all. But at the end of the day, I can't please everybody. Um, I'm not going to please everybody. And uh, God is going to ultimately take care of me. And people, people have looked at me like I was crazy because I have been willing to say to people that I have even worked with or for, hey, you know, if, if you don't feel like I'm the best fit, <laughs> then, then you may have to make a decision because at the end of the day, I know that I'm doing all that I can. You know what I mean? And I'm doing all, I'm, I'm doing the, the best that I can. And I refuse to allow people to cause me, like, I, I, I'm not going to work extra hard to, to, to please you so that you can reward me. No, I feel like I should work hard, period, or smart, um, or, or some, some, some balance, some, some, somewhere in between working hard and smart. You know what I mean? And give it 100% at all times and then allow God to do what God does. And, and this is me. Um, and when I learned to do that, I've never had to worry about anything. Because I've always felt like, hey, if this is for me, I'm going to be here. If it's not, God got something else for me. Um, so, so we got to give it over to God so that all of our expectations that people place in things will bring, um, will, will not have to bring you lasting fulfillment and, and lasting, you know, there, well, I'm going to leave it alone. Number two, remember uh, that everything negative that happens to us can be reframed into something positive. Yeah, yeah. I got laid off on my job. Listen, I, I'll never forget, I was sharing with my wife. I said, listen, you know, I really have a desire to do ministry full time. And I think two weeks after I had that conversation, I got laid off my job. I mean, and, and now mind you, I'm doing a job that I wrote the manual on how to do it. So I felt pretty secure in my job. I felt like, hey, this is, you know, I'm all right. Um, I'll never forget, though, my, my boss came to me and said, hey, have you considered doing A, B, and C? And I said, no, I really haven't thought about that. You, you don't think about A, B, and C? Me not knowing, you know, what, what they're trying to get at. What they were doing was they were phasing out my particular job. And so he was giving me an opportunity to go work at this other job without saying, hey, why don't you come work for this other job? So he said, have you considered? Well, maybe you should consider it. Okay, all right, man, I think I'm good. I, I, I like what I'm doing. Um, and then the next thing I know, I lost my job. Lost my job, lost it. Um, but watch this, because I trust in God, even losing my job, I started working for my church at that time full time. And I was I was able to do more making what at least half of, of what I was making in corporate America, half of it, the Lord was able to do something, and it was an eye-opener to me that said, Oh, look at this negative that turned into a positive. You know, it was negative that I got laid off, but what's positive is that now I'm being pushed into the area where the Lord really wants me and where I, I really had a desire to be. And, and I haven't looked back since. Praise God. So, so um, we got to become the CEO of our lives. And part of becoming the CEO of our lives is, you know, giving it over to God. Give up or give to God all of your expectations. God, God, you got it. God, you got it. Um, all right.
let's uh had another point on that, but I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Uh, step six, recruit assistance. And I'm gonna I'm gonna uh stop here. Recruit assistance. All right. Uh, all CEOs have assistance. They don't know it all. They can't do it all. They got assistance. Recruit willing assistants, not manipulated ones. Choose people who agree, watch this, to help take care of yourself and stay responsible for yourself. My brothers and sisters, it's almost like having an accountability partner. But don't pick accountability partners who are going to let you slack because they slack or because you two are just alike and uh, you're going to be all right. We got to choose assistance in our lives that are going to hold us accountable. Who are going to tell us uh, the truth. And the truth is, I love you with the love of God, but you're wrong. Or I love you with the love of God, but maybe you should consider thinking it this way. It'll help you out in the long run. Or, you know, you got to have people who are willing to help, but not, watch this, but in a way that is going to, to make sure make sure that you stay on track. Because we, we could pick, you know, oftentimes they say, what, birds of a feather? flock together. So often we pick people in our lives who are just like us. They think like we think, they act like we act, they do what, you know, the same stuff we do. Um, and then we expect them to be accountable, but you can't expect someone who's exactly like you and who will let you slide because you are sliding um, to be accountable for you. Are you with me here? So you got to pick people who are going to support you in this. Um, who who can be accountable? People can't help unless they know what you need. Another per, another thing is you gotta you gotta pick people in your lives to help you that you can you can tell the truth to. You can you can be open with. This is where I fall short. This 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 these are my buttons, and I'm struggling with my buttons. I'm working on them because I ain't there yet, but this is where I am. You need people, um, so, so you need people that, uh, if you don't tell people what your buttons are, then uh, they may never know, and as a result, may not be able to offer the help that, that, that you really need. So, so step six in taking control of your emotions and reactions to life is recruit assistance, recruit assistance. All right, y'all, I'm going to stop right there for the night. I'm going to stop right there. I will entertain any questions, comments, or concerns um, at this time, but I'm going to stop there um, because I want to give next week's class, uh, the entire class on the last section of this chapter, which is on choosing forgiveness. Pastor, I'm just, I just, I just um, picked up on when you just said this part about recruiting someone that will, will work with you. But that's, that, that almost went back to where you had the phrase earlier about having someone to say that you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. You see, that, that almost keyed right in with that because if you have someone that's not going to tell you when you're wrong and it's going to go along with you, you all are scratching each other's back and you're not going anyplace. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. You, 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 you know, um, now listen, if if you wanna if you're trying to soar with eagles, you can't be hanging out with pigeons. Right? You 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 have to say, okay, well I, I need somebody who could keep me, you know, hold me accountable on a whole different level. All right. Uh anyone else? No, no comments, no concerns. Well, thank you for listening to me tonight. Uh we will continue our discussion. And like I said, next week is, is going to be solely on choosing forgiveness. Well, do y'all know forgiveness is a, is, a, is a big thing? Yes, it is. It's heavy. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, it is. All right. Well, if there are no comments, concerns, or questions, uh, deacons, we're in your hands. Okay. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you.
thank you for allowing us to come tonight as we study the DNA of relationships. Lord, um, according to what we studied a few weeks ago, we are made for relationship, uh, relationships with each other, relationships with God. Lord, we're just thanking you for this opportunity to possibly get it right as we study this lesson. Lord, you heard the request of um, for those that are St. John's that are, are under the weather, may have an illness here, here or there. Lord, as the almighty healer, we know that you can take control and just clear those illnesses right up. Yes. Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity that you have given us as we come together. Lord, we pray for Sister Bar Darlene and as the, for condolences for the loss of Sister Elsie, her mom. Lord, we pray that as we come to go through these next couple of days, Lord, just let everybody know that you are in control and all yes. we have to do yes. is ask because you have supplied our need all of these years for whatever age we are. It was you that provided. It was you that gave us what we needed. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you. Lord, now I close this prayer, just giving you praise, honor, and glory for the many blessings that you bestowed because, on us because we know it's not anything that we did on our own. But Lord, we just thank you for what you have done yesterday. Lord, we thank you, what you for what you have done today. And Lord, we just thanking you in advance for what you may do for us tomorrow. All these blessings we do thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Mr. Jasper. Thank you for joining us, and we pray that you enjoyed the message. If you are looking for a church home, come and worship with us during our Sunday morning service starting at 10 a.m. We are located at 2387 Morris Avenue in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. And be sure to visit our website at www.stjohnscotchplains.org for more information. Here at the Dome, we enter to worship, leaving to serve.